Transcribers User Conference. We're starting with a session called Transcribers in Practice. And our next speaker is David Brown from Trinity College Dublin. Welcome, David. Good morning. We did a little project with Google about four years ago. Uh, one of the developers told us that their ideal archive was a little black box, a big dog and a human. The archive was in the little black box. The big dog was to make sure that nobody touches the little black box, and the human was there to keep the dog. <laughs> so this is our little black box. The Public Records Office of Ireland was opened in 1867 after a long campaign of historians and civil servants to have a single repository for all Irish state papers. The collections have grown over the years and were housed in fairly unsatisfactory dirty buildings all across the city and were basically inaccessible to most people. Very few people even knew a lot of these records existed. So the building when it opened was part of Dublin's forecourt complex was a state-of-the-art facility with modern climate control and a brand new photosynchography machine which in 1867 was the GPU of its day. Over the next 50 years, all of Ireland's important, record, important records were brought to this building and it created one of the best archives in Europe that stretched the whole way back to the high middle ages. On the 20th of June 1922, in the middle of a civil war fought in Ireland that was newly independent from Britain, to celebrate our independence we completely destroyed the archive. There were only maybe 100 pieces of paper left. Since then, the most common complaint of Irish historians has been the lack of evidence to conduct historical research. The loss of the public record office was catastrophic, but during its short life, a surprising amount of records had in fact been copied, and before its existence, they've been copied in these other little repositories, either by historians or by government agencies. Many records that dated from long before 1867 have been very well used and more than one copy exists. The Beyond 2022 project, the Trinity, aims to reconstruct as much of the lost archive as possible from copies and surveys, and replace them in this new virtual record treasury that's been built from the original architect's plan. So what you're looking at there is a digital model of the original building. Thanks to early publishers, <coughs> produced a report every year to say what records they received and where they were put in the archive. We can actually pinpoint the shelf of the original building and put our virtual copies onto the correct shelf, and then we have a three-dimensional avatar that will walk you around the building and take you to the record if you have a lot of time, otherwise you can obviously just put it on the screen. <laughs> just before the record office was destroyed in 1919, a complete guide to the contents was published, and from this we've been able to create a database for all of the lost records. And these entries are linked to metadata that describes the replacement that we found, its current location, and the space digital image where available. Otherwise, it brings you to the link in the other repositories catalog where you can go and find it. And that just shows you how the database works. That's the copy that we found in Marsh's library. And you can see in the bottom there, it says that it was copied before the Great Fire. So the project itself marks a unique coming together of the holders of the largest collection of Irish records. And this hasn't been done before. Our project board includes the National Archives of the UK, the Public Records Office of Northern Ireland, our own Public Records Office, and the Irish Manuscripts Commission that's been involved in creating all the transcriptions since it was established in 1938. But the project has developed, we found copies and surrogates in Archives large and small, really all over the place. This particular set is the medieval chantry rows. And we found 13 repositories had quite large selections of copies of that. Our search goes wider when we get to the more general records, and this gives you an idea of over the over 60 that we've currently found copies of Irish records in, and that are all certified as having been copied in the public record office before it was destroyed. That doesn't include all the ones that we're pretty sure were originally Irish records. So the Huntington, which is a very relaxing place to work, is one such repository. The Huntington purchases enormous amounts of our early modern manuscripts for their own collections, particularly relating to British and Irish history, but they also have very large holdings of Renaissance manuscripts from all over Europe. So if you're not familiar with what they have, it's worth going to have a look because you may be surprised to find that 
they're extremely wealthy buyers that come to auctions in Europe and simply have bought up everything in the room. This seems to be the way they operate. It's not technically about capital up, though, it's one of the drawbacks, and it is actually worth a trip. One of the items, one of their volumes is a collection of transcripts from a predecessor of the public record office, which was the Birmingham Tower in Dublin Castle. And these were produced by the Irish Record Commission that was established in the early 19th century to transcribe and to calendar as many early Irish state papers as they could find. They fell apart in 1830. There was some problem with money and there was some problem with people getting paid and having worked together for about 20 years. We have a lot of evidence they hated each other. So the copies of which we reckon there were at least 80,000 pages were dispersed. Some of them found their way back into the Irish Public Record Office. A lot of them were sold to the collection of Sir Thomas Phillips, who was a major English collector of manuscripts, when his library was sold in the 1920s and 1930s. Places like Huntington ended up owning quite a lot of volumes. They're all very, very similar. It was a common agency, so as you can expect, all of the collectors are trained. They're all very, very similar. And um, what we found, we basically call it now a meta collection, a collection of collections. And we find these very similar examples of these calendars in repositories pretty much everywhere in Europe. The last one there is one that was kept in the public record office, in which it's in an outside room and the bottom of the fire. The rest of them all come from, they're all taken in these auctions and various other sources. We've developed. We decided to use transcribers because, as you can see, this is perfect for transcribers. If transcribers were being developed by us, we would have designed it to do exactly this job. <laughs> and we get character error rates of less than 3% for all of these. So we're basically using this as essentially a full OCR system. We developed two tools to speed up the work. We have a tool that was developed by Stephen Crane, and that's on the, we did a blog post that was in September, and it's on GitHub, and it will search all of our available models for the best match. We know there are only 30 clerks involved, we have 10 models already, so it's a quick job to search to see if we already have the model. If we don't have the model, it's usually going to be giving us 95% accuracy anyway, because they're all trained to do it in exactly the same way. It also helps us, for example, the Huntington, it's not signed, we don't know who did it, but through the transcribers model, we were able to find that it was actually done by the same person who did the Minus model. And it's just another one in that series that got broken up in an auction. So we find it useful both for handwriting recognition and for speeding up, for basic action, finding the right model to use. The second tool that we've developed, because our project partners thought we should, this again is the scale of 350 volumes so far. We think there's 500 volumes. We reckon it's going to be 20 million words, it could be 30 million words, because we don't know how much stuff these people produced. We've written a auto routine that will put into triple IF, and this is because our partners, the National Archives in the UK, the three National Archives wanted us to work with Triple IF because they work with Triple IF. So we're using Triple IF as our viewer. Uh, we're probably going to be producing one without the text down the side, we'll just be highlighting the manuscript where the way that you were looking at yesterday, you were, So it does basically the same job. And this is using IIIF, and so that we can use different types of documents and look at them on the screen at the same time. So the one on the left is a publication that was done by the Irish Manuscripts Commission about 30 years ago, and it's in the same series as a manuscript volume we found in the Royal Irish Academy. The content and the structure of both of them, they're both just a calendar of the same big long series of compositions. <coughs> so the <coughs> structure of the model is exactly the same, they're just from different parts of the country. But we can read the micro collection this way, you can search across any type of document, whether it was originally published and printed, or whether it was originally manuscript. We've been involved with entity disambiguation for about 12 years, and we use entity disambiguation and entity extraction to we, can, we do automatic indexing. So here you see those two separate spellings of Sir Charles Coote. And if you don't know much Irish history, Sir Charles Coote was a psychotic madman who murdered millions, so hundreds and hundreds of people in Connacht in the 1650s and then inherited a large amount of land 
the paging of them, you can actually wear Oliver Cromwell's clothes. And they put his head on it and take an Oliver Cromwell's head off. <laughs> but we can disambiguate the text to a greater index. So we can do this in quite a wide array using all different tools. We have the name based ontologies that we use, and we also have mathematical routines that will use these distance algorithms to put together words we don't, we don't really know what they are. We can do the same thing with place names, and we have worked with the Old and Serbian Ireland to match the old place names with modern place names and that will work for us. So ultimately the user will be able to go to that location, say Street View, and have a look at it. We can also use text disambiguation to find the content. So when you have a when we respect an entity, we can also interrogate the language. Somebody went to somewhere, somebody lived, somebody died, somebody got married in, somebody mentioned the same sentence as somebody else in various different contexts. And we can automatically produce these network graphs of their associations. So we find that this is going to be an excellent tool for historical research, as well as for things like genealogy. And we've even found some use for it in environmental research. You can use synonyms for various environmental events and you can put together graphs which link those to historical events. For example, if it was an unusually wet year, was there a lot of unrest? So we do find it very useful. And so coming along with it. So ultimately our virtual repository will hopefully be a replacement for our original repository and it will become a new national memory because we actually don't have official records going back further than 1922 at the moment, so this will push us back another 800 years, hopefully within the next three or four years. So, any questions? Sounds amazing. Um, I've probably seen medieval history, so searching for lost documents is really, really familiar. Questions or comments for David? I would ask uh, when um, you thought about this project, um, which kind of experiences uh, in other countries uh, have you found just to um, build uh, the way of? find solutions for, for your project. Did you? It actually derived from a, an Irish project that we did in 2012 called the Down Survey. It was one of those maps that we saw. Uh, the Cromelians, when they were seizing Irish land after the conquest in the 1650s, mapped the entire country and they produced about 2,000 large scale catastrophe maps that basically showed every field and linked to that to a set of records that showed who owned every single parcel of land. That was assumed to have been completely lost on the planet. Mm -hmm. But we knew of a couple of volumes uh, in the Bibliothèque Nationale de France that had been taken by pirates on the way back to England, and some other bits and pieces, and we thought we'd get together as many of those as we can. In the course of the project, we actually found all of them in about 25 different depositories. So what we thought was, well, if we can put together this important set of lost archives, maybe we can put together the rest of it. And that's really where the idea from the project came. So that's not even a European experience, it's from an Irish project. Thanks a lot for the, for the great talk. Just a, a brief question about the IIIF uh, implementation you have been doing. So this is used for display, and do you do first an export of the page XML, or can you directly um, use the page XML and to display the, the transcriptions in your IIIF view because I mean IIIF is going to be the topic for transcribers. We, uh, we go directly from the transcribers output to IIIF. Okay, so you're running a IIIF server for the images yeah. and you, you grab the, uh, okay that's great, you need to publish it. <laughs> I'm sure we will in the next few weeks. Great, thanks a lot. Okay, let's thank David again. <laughs>
I've been here, here working on. And I'm going to talk about prospects and uh, biases in uh, some uh, regarding to some 16th century Swedish material. And uh, when I talk about uh, Swedish uh, documents, I mean documents that are written in Swedish and that were um, related to the history of Finland or Sweden as Finland was part of the Swedish realm during the 16th century. And um, I, I'm, I'm kind of trying to make case uh, for my the time period that I am exposing as a 16th century historian. I have seen many uh, biases that affect the choice of research topics, and I'm not talking about political biases, but the fact that uh, the sources that are best available often are the sources that are studied most. And here is a, a picture that I often use when I teach or talk about the way how the documents survive from oblivion as the as first, of course, there are the historical processes, the partial documentation of the historical events in the first place. Uh, but uh, what is quite important and what, what affects our historical research, whether we want it or not, is also the way how the selection and archiving of sources is done in the organizations like archives or universities or libraries. And uh, studying the 16th century documents, I have become very much aware of that when it comes to the medieval times of Finland. There we have wonderful medieval documents, parchments and stuff. Those have been uh, quite well catalogued and uh, studied. When we go to the 17th century, there we have the Swedish administration, central administration, uh, taking form and it's a wonderful, massive, administration with lots of archives, well documented, well catalogued. When it comes to the 16th century, it's a bit of a mess. It's a rough time, Reformation period, lots of organizations, ecclesiastic organizations, vanished or were active, working, were in difficult, facing difficult times. The lay organizations were changing, so the problem then is that the material from the 16th century is not easily available, it is scattered, it is written in uh, on very fragile papers that are in decay, some are very difficult to read nowadays. So my aim then has been to do something about it, to take the poor 16th century documents in, in, in the focus, in the hope that I could then make them more understandable, more readable, bring them to the more to the core of the uh, future and present day research. And there is an example of uh, some volumes that we are starting with. It's called Acta Historica, it's in the National Archives of Finland. And uh, similar kinds of documents are also in the Except Kibet. On the Swedish side, at least, as uh, after the independence of Finland, the documentation was kind of uh, divided between uh, Sweden and, and Finland. There, one has to study, go to many archives to study them, unless we digitize them better. And uh, at the Historica in the National Archives of Finland, it goes some 2,000 pages of miscellany uh, different documents, mostly from the 16th century, and uh, these documents are related to administrative decisions and orders. The problem with them is that they are letters from the king, letters to the king, copies of letters, copies of complaints, copies of private letters, and uh, these are written with many different hands. So there will be, uh, we will need uh, quite a lot of work. However, we are uh, relying on previous very undigital work done by my, me and my colleagues, as uh, there are uh, previous transcriptions, and uh, we are trying to fit the um, 
transcriptions, existing transcriptions with the uh, scanned documents in the hope that we can then learn or make the uh, system uh, read the variety of hands available in the 16th century documents. Even here, uh, the best scribes are easiest to read. The king had the best scribes, so what you see here is the letter from the King John III, and I guess that more work must be done in order to uh, make also the poor handwriting of uh, local uh, churchmen and bailiffs to be uh, readable. And this is a, just an example, and the work is very much in, in progress. But the plan is to build a larger 16th century source project around this, so that we will benefit and promote uh, transcripts and read, and, uh, but also uh, otherwise build uh, a more uh, solid and catalogued and indexed uh, knowledge about the 16th century Nordic past. Thank you. Thank you, Anu. Uh, comments or questions? Anu? Anyone? Okay. Uh, if not, uh, thank you, Anu, a lot. And uh, our next presentation is given by Manek Slon, Mikolai Slon, and Adam Sopala. I'm so sorry about the pronunciation, but I know. So, it's uh, like the second of our names, Manek Slon, Mikolai Slon, and Adam Sopala. I'm from Poland, from, from Warsaw. We work in Warsaw. And our task is for, to index tax registers of 16th century. So I did the project which started 140 years ago. First idea of uh, reconstruction of the full settlement network and uh, space structure of the state was formulated and started already in the 19th century. And more than six years ago we started a series with, uh, good, with precise rules of reconstruction and of, and of uh, presentation. And in two years, I have to complete this work. <laughs> the main effect of the work is the map of uh, 16th century Poland with all settlements existing in the time, with the names in this time, with some data about each village, so uh, legal status, uh, large ownership, uh, and also localization is not so evident in uh, every cases. And our main source are tax register from 16th century. So normally uh, one settlement uh, is mentioned about 10 times in different years. Of course, uh, that's a part of the documentation survive. Uh, and sometimes it's just one or two mentions and the other case is about uh, 20. But generally speaking, we each settlement should be mentioned sometimes, and there are status of this village, a name, and some tax categories, so economic objects, people, land of use, and how many parts of this uh, was taxed in, in the year. And we transferred this map, printed in several volumes in the last 50 years, into a GIS database, and now we would like to provide each point of this map with some footnotes because our reconstruction made in these 60 years based on the source but the user had no uh, access to sources used by us. So our database is a triangle, we have scans of manuscript, tables with data type from, uh, from this and a map and all are connecting uh, together. In our database we have about 25,000 of uh, settlements 
And this, uh, the main uh, series of our source, it's about 70,000 pages of manuscript written by uh, <laughs> several hundreds of, of, of hands. And uh, not only hands, but type of style of, of writing. And we, we think that it's about uh, 250,000 mentions about concrete settlements in, in this series. So you can see that it is definitely the, the task for transcribers. So we decided to, to check how we can use this tool to help us. We created the model based first on seven titles. I mean, it is the same as the style. We choose the seven sample of the same uh, style in other hands. But how you can see in these mm -hmm. photos, uh, we have some, our uh, material has some features which doesn't perfectly fit to transcript. First of all, we have several languages. It is sometimes in Polish, sometimes in Latin, sometimes in the one, on one page you have Polish and Latin. What's more, we have very irregular, uh, a lot of irregular uh, abbreviations. <laughs> That's why yesterday I was asking several times about it. And, uh, but the, another problem, which is the biggest, is that we have different style of headlines and the rest of the text. So, we made a model, but unfortunately this HDR model is not perfect. I mean, our CR is uh, 25%. I mean, we didn't make so huge model, it's only 11,000 of words, so Winter said that if we will make it bigger, maybe it will be better. But 25% is definitely insufficient for us. Here I have an example that mostly the words which are frequently, they, they are the transcripts read them well. But the biggest problem is with these headlines, which are crucial for us, uh, because it is the name of the cities. So our problem is that these headlines are written in another, totally another way than the rest of the text. And here you have an uh, example that the, this headline is, I mean, transcript is really the worst. So that's why we have to find some tool to make it better. Yes. So basically the problem is that since we train the model on the whole document, it's very inaccurate for the headlines that are most interesting to us. And one solution would be to create a different model specifically for the headlines to increase accuracy in, re in transcribing those very headlines. And this would require basically to filter our data set to only feed it the headlines. But to do this by hand would be um, extremely a lot of work. So I'm helping by creating a tool that will do this automatically. And uh, I'm going to create a, I mean, I'm creating a there are a network that is supposed to classify uh, those headlines, so we can create a data set to construct a model only for the headlines. And maybe the biggest difference from most transcribers, uh, the transcriber users, is that they are working with the transcription desktop application. But to create my classifier, I need to work directly, directly on the communication API. So basically, my work will be this AI part. I have to filter from the layout analysis that I use from transcribers and filter it and get only the headlines. So this is how it's, it's supposed to work. I get the separate lines and then I need to classify, put all the normal lines in one classifier in, in one class. So we don't use it to create this new model that is supposed to be more accurate for headlines. And then put all the headlines in the second class. So to approach this task I will use a convolutional neural network. Uh, very similar to what transcribers used, uses for layout analysis and I will also for, uh, also for transcribe. I will not go into the details of conventional neural networks since this would be a very long presentation there. <laughs> but one of the main challenges that uh, I'm facing with creating this classifier is that actually I have very different size of input because as you know lines in this um, historical documents can be of very different size and usually those classifiers for images are expecting a normalized input so <laughs> an input of uh, a fixed size so one of the a possible solutions for this might be a, a system of stacked uh, autoencoders to, to generate, to generate um, stars outputs of uh, yeah of of non trivial uh, yeah non trivial sparse outputs to feed them to my classifier. Alright. So what what we 
want to do and then the end, we would like to index these 70,000 of pages and this index connect with a digital map. And for this purpose, we need transcribers, but with some additional apps. Thank you. Thank you for your excellent presentations. Any questions or comments? Yes. So I would like to ask her two questions. First, regarding the abbreviations, Latin abbreviations. So did you just expand it in your transcriptions? And how did you do that? Yeah, the regular ones we, we, we did, but the irregular ones we left without the, the I mean, like uh, only the, the letters which are I mean, yesterday we spoke about it a lot, that there are several tools which can help us somehow, like, uh, for example, tagging, but we have to test it, how it will work. But we don't have answer yet how to do it. And the second question, I assume that the Polish orthography in that time was probably quite different than today's orthography, and I have this feeling that transcripts is sometimes more like transliteration, that you have to write like the letters as they used to be, than like all this modern way of editing. How do you deal with that? Are you like adapting it to the modern Polish orthography or the new transcription, or is it in the old Polish orthography? Yeah, the problem is there was no stable orthography at the time. So we cannot, <laughs> it's uh, impossible to use. And the second thing, what is interesting for us, uh, there are names, geographic names of settlements. So we use uh, vocabulary, we have the, all this name, a list of these names with some source versions of, of this material, these items. And we would like to use, we combine, uh, like to combine transcribers with our GIS database so that transcribers will use our list of names taken from the sources. Thank you, thank you very much. What you were just explaining, that you use the, the dictionary map of the variants of place names in order um, to to, help, to to find for it in lots of labels. Um, so the question is, is it also affecting, I mean, can you do OCR correction while, it, because I, I'm doing something similar, but when I'm trying to find variants of place name, uh, many times I have to decide if it's an OCR error or, or not, and then if it's an OCR error, I would like to correct it, this is uh, rel relative to that. And then, do you also use these variants defined to, to add to your database of, of, uh, of to the dictionary? Sorry. Oh, this solution is not ready yet. <laughs> so I cannot answer exactly how it, how it works. Uh, so I hope we will we can use the list of names because we have a list of names, each name from 16th century. We have uh, the source versions, we have normalized versions, and today versions. And uh, we would like to, to search with keyword spotting all forms in a given part of, uh, of this uh, uh, tax register. I'm not sure if under, would under your question and answer the question. I think next day we will manage to, to, to answer you about that. Because the work is in progress. Thank you, very interesting. I, I want to ask if you said you have a list of place names. Uh, have you connected this to some kind of national ontology of like municipalities and places, or is it like like you have got, have you have you kind of uh, tried to map the place entities in some kind of uh, historical level? Do you understand what I mean? With settlements, it's quite simple because this. Uh, Network was based off the uh, autonomous villages, so it's no ontological problem with uh, settlements. Uh, sometimes, but it's uh, two or three percent. It's no problem. We have also an ontological project, ontology of historical geography in Poland. But the, the main questions uh, are with uh, uh, districts, political well, communities, etc., and not in a given time because what we are doing now. Is one point. It's uh, 16th century, <laughs> so we have not problem with with the ontological questions uh, of settlements. Okay, thank you. Okay, 
Okay, let's thank Marek, Nikolai, and Adam. Thank you. So, our next speaker is Chris Day from the National Archives of UK. Welcome, Chris. I'm um, sorry, I'll start with the customary question for asking that Bridget came in. Uh, so, uh, my name is Chris Day, I'm from the National Archives of the United Kingdom. Um, we are the British government's uh, central archive. Uh, we've got about 200 kilometers of shelving, and uh, I'm very happy to be here. So, today I'm going to be talking about some of the work we've been doing with transcribers, which I have recently got involved in, so I don't know the answers are what we've made, but we'll certainly try. So, the principal collection we've been using transcribers on is a collection called Prop 11, which are uh, wills or last testaments from uh, the property of Court of Canterbury. Effectively, it's a very large collection. The property of Court of Canterbury approved and sort of uh, passed the wills of uh, people who either own property over a certain value in the Diocese of Canterbury, which covers most of the southeast of England, including London, and also proved the wills of people who held property, property in multiple dioceses, and uh, also proved the wills and testaments of uh, people who owned uh, property overseas. Basically, the collection runs from the late 14th century uh, through to the mid 19th century. Uh, there's around 2,000 uh, physical volumes, uh, they are copies of, of the original wills. Um, and there's about a million wills or all, all, and um, it says there are an estimated 10 people per will, as in 10 people are mentioned in each person's will on average. Uh, and what we thought would be useful to do with them is, uh, they are written pretty consistently throughout their time. In, in English, it's the very early ones in Latin. Uh, and they're also written pretty consistently in the same kind of handwriting and they are very formulaic in their structure, they are, they are legal documents, so there are sort of forms of words that have to be used and are used consistently throughout most of the run. And the other thing we thought would be useful about them, this is up there you can see a copy of them, uh, they are sort of already digitised on a digital microfilm, so they were, they were put onto microfilm in the 1970s I believe, which was uh, subsequently digitised, which has caused some problems which I will do to in a minute. But what's exciting about them is we've currently got them catalogued to um, sort of uh, have the, the name, a date of death, and the sort of uh, the uh, execution of the will itself is, is proving by court, uh, an occupation, and a place name. But by transcribing them, we'll be able to provide huge amounts of detail. This is a network map that we haven't generated using computer samples and made it, but it just sort of shows the number of connections in one will. I'll have a larger image here. Uh, so this is the, the will of uh, Catherine Sturgis, uh, who died in the early 18th century. And you can see here just the, the vast array of connections, property, place names, so you put the sort of come off just, just one will. So uh, being able to transcribe these things can give us a, a wonderful insight of people's networks uh, over a very long period. And so we started doing some work with it, and like, we've encountered some issues, but we've had some success as well. So, um, I'm going to try and give an overview of, of what work we've done so far and what we hope to do in the future. So, as I've said, the images are not the greatest quality, but that's probably one of the better quality ones. So, I think it's a problem that many of us in our both deal with the, a lot of our digital life material is, is from microfilm. So, that sort of creates the problems when putting it into to the platform. So, uh, the conditions and the fact that the segmentation, so these sort of blemishes at the top of the page there, they get segmented as lines. Uh, and then, yes, again, subsequently, so they great small results. And also uh, here, those two sort of lines which are, you know, are used to sort of to fill up the space so it can't be filled in with anything else, like when you write a check. Um, those have been segmented to several lines as well, so that, again, that causes some problems. That's for a regular feature. There's also been some, some issues with uh, the, the characters themselves and uh, the program recognizing them as, as, as one character as being separate characters, which leads to some slightly odd spelling. So, this M on the, on the far left has been recognised as two ones there, because I think there's a famous between the, uh, the, the centre and the, the second centre. You get an F, but you get an F. It becomes a three there. Uh, so this one here is uh, it's, so it's a pretty standard phrase in the will in the name of God. So that the N there has been split into two characters, so one is an L, and then the second one is an L as well. So we get um, we have the interesting. <laughs> Which I've heard is lovely. Um, and again, again, there's a gap between the ascenders and the descenders there. So uh, you know, we have A men becoming uh, E men in men. Compared to some other projects, we haven't done quite as much work. Uh, we've done some small training models, and we've had some interesting results. So 
uh, used a uh, training data of uh, 26 images, uh, so it's about 16,000 16, words, with about uh, 2,000 distinct words. And then France in uh, test data with 10 images, uh, generating a transcription of the, the training data. And so that was about 7,000 words with 877 distinct words, uh, 388 of which were, were, were new. And so that's been interesting. And so these are some of the new words that have, have worked quite well. Uh, some of which are quite complicated, so it's, it's interesting. And you can sort of see, you know, it gives us an idea of stuff we might find in the text as well. Some of the lines are private, so those bodies are going to come up with words quite a lot. Um, I think Lambert, maybe because there was a particularly long will by someone of the name of Lambert, in the 10 of it, we did the train later with. Um, but otherwise, quite good. Some of the, um, some less new good words. So, and this sort of shows some of the sort of slightly strange words we've been having. So, and the, you can see why as well. So, in that case, the, the, the line segmentation is sort of dripped down into the, 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 uh, the uh, preceding line. In this case, two lines of text have been taken together as one, so this led to quite a transcription. Now, this one, this uh, riff, 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 I don't, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's, like, it's like a monster from an HP Lovecraft. But obviously, that is, again is the cosmetic line, so basically, this mark at the very bottom of the page where the microphone is dark and has been picked up as text, and as a result, we have this sort of neologism. So, as an example of a transcription, not the greatest, but it's, it's, it's you know, readable in parts. But what we have had success with, like so many other people have presented, is with uh, the keyword searching. So in this case, we've searched for nephew, which is obviously a very common thing to find in Will's family relations. And, you know, the, the keyword uh, spotting has worked quite well. Uh, I've been asked by one of my colleagues who's done a bit more work on this to ask if we can get the page behind the keyword spotting, but that's a bit different time. And so this has allowed us to do some interesting things to try and improve the, the transcription. So um, my colleague Mark Bell has been uh, using a Python to try and basically work with trigrams of words, the first two words are the same, there is a, a different one at the end to try and correct spelling errors um, by looking at sort of common trigrams for all of the data that we've used um, and uh, basically create Python scripts to be able to deal with that. So we were looking at sort of particular, so you can see here the combinations we find regularly. Uh, so obviously four names, it's have a dictionary of four names and so on. And also other words. So for instance, with said nephew, we find that in the data we looked at, it's the four name there. And so what we can do is start to build a model which corrects the spelling. And you can see that. So it, 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 it sort of comes with a solution for the issues we've had. Um, I'm aware of the uh, amount of time, so uh, I'm just going to go through what we're planning to do in the near future. So we're looking to sort of speak to uh, people, um, not just historians, but technologists as well, and try and have a multidisciplinary approach to see what we can do with this, uh, the information that hopefully the transcription will create, the wills, and uh, how we can solve our problems. Hopefully put a network around together to, uh, to facilitate sort of more discussions. Uh, we also have a postdoctoral fellow uh, who just started working who's uh, looking to do basically mixing HDR with crowdsourcing. The idea being that we create ground truth with the HDR and the QA, but somehow trying to have a platform which sort of gamifies the corrections in a similar way to Google did with the or <coughs> their books observed as many years ago, uh, to try and sort of help increase, improve our model. Uh, so with that, I'd like very much. Questions or comments? Just a question. Uh, did you work with speech analytics? Um, did you create the dictionary for you? I think we're just working with the English dictionary. Uh, just the English dictionary. English dictionary. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, the, the new version will uh, create an internal dictionary with, with the training. Okay. So with the new model, with the HDR Plus, you will get also a dictionary based on training data. Okay. So then, then uh, we assume that that would help. Any other questions? Okay, if not, thank you, Chris. <laughs> so, um, the last paper in this session is given by Olga Bello Borodova, Mark Dylan, and Joshua Scheible. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. So, my name is Olga Bello Borodova and together with my two colleagues, 
Bob Dylan and Joshua Schäuble. Uh, I'm here to present our upcoming transcribers based project called Catch 2020. Now, before I move on to the project itself, a few words about our team back home. Our research group is called Antwerp Centre for Digital Humanities and Literary Criticism, ACDC for short. <laughs> Um, and we're basically a team of scholars working in uh, digital humanities, based at the University of Antwerp, um, working in digital humanities, digital scholarly editing, and more specifically, textual genesis of modernist works, and how to computationally analyze it. In other words, we work with modern manuscripts, which are often very messy and extremely difficult to read, as I'm sure many of you know. Um, our approach to the transcribers technology is from a genetic critical point of view, the purpose of making a genetic critical edition. So that's something that's something we should bear in mind. Part of the ACDC research group is the Center for Manuscript Genetics. And over the years, the CMG has developed expertise in digital scholarly editing by working mainly with manuscripts by James Joyce and Samuel Beckett. One of the projects run uh, the CMG is the Beckett Digital Manuscript Project, which is a digital, digital genetic edition of Samuel Beckett's works. It is precisely the experience we have garnered while making that edition that we would like to use in our cooperation with transcribers. So, what is CATCH 2020? The acronym stands for Computer Assisted Transcription of Complex Handwriting. It's a three-year research project which is funded by the Research Foundation Flanders and Daria of Belgium, which is an organization that supports digital humanities initiatives in Belgium. So let's quickly discuss the acronym. I'm sure you're all familiar with the concept of complex handwriting, and we'll encounter a few examples in the presentation. But what do we mean by computer-assisted? Well, what we certainly don't mean is that computer-assisted means fully automated. So why don't we believe in fully automated, at least at this point in time? Well, the answer is simple. As genetic editors, it is our task to produce accurate transcriptions and to enrich them with annotations and markup. So we know that transcribers technology currently achieves a very impressive character error rate of only 5% with good training data and relatively neat hand. Unfortunately, we are more interested in the really messy hands of modernist writers. But regardless of that, for the purposes of scholarly editing, only 95 success rate is just not good enough. Even 99.9% .9 success rate uh, could not possibly wait the proofreading stage, because it will still generate more than one mistake per page. Because the editor's role in an edition is so crucial, we propose to put the editor in the driving seat rather than technology. In other words, instead of letting the machine do the bulk of the work and the human proofreader correct it, we want the trained human editor to get assisted by transcribers functionalities just at the right times in her workflow. This is by no means our own idea. We met with the read teams from Innsbruck and Valencia in Antwerp just two months ago, and the impressive developments that Veronica Romero and Enrique Vidal uh, shared with us they also apply the same logic in their work. While they focus on computationally supporting the transcription process, we hope to support the specific workflows of digital scholarly editors, or even more specific, of genetic editors that work on complex modernist handwriting. So the research question that underlies Catch 2020 is the following. How can the core functions of transcribers best be integrated into the workflows of digital scholarly editors. And the core functions we're talking about are the layout analysis and handwritten uh, text recognition. But there's also another one, which is not yet part of the transcriber's desktop client. The facsimile transcript mapping for cases in which you have a textual transcript already, so the editors work. Although there is a tool available, um, but it's not part of the transcript's interface. So our plan is to implement a web-based virtual research environment that supports digital scholarly editors at producing text genetic digital editions at all stages of their workflow. In the best case, this development is not a new standalone web interface, but an add-on or a module 
of the existing or currently developed transcribers web interface. The target group is scholars with training in editorial theory and with a particular focus on genetic criticism, but with rather little technological know-how. We want to help the editors organize their facsimiles, decide for annotation guidelines, transcribe their documents, annotate their documents with further information, map their transcripts to the facsimiles, and publish their results, all in one workflow. At specific points within this workflow, uh, the editor has the option to get computational support by calling the Transcribers REST API, where tasks are executed, results are sent back and processed seamlessly within that environment. We think that collaboration is key here. It's better to build on and merge existing developments than to start from scratch and reinvent the wheel. Tools for most of these problems have already been developed in institutions across Reed, and our aim is to incorporate these solutions into our workflow and add features to them to cater to our specific needs. So what kind of needs are we talking about? Let's quickly go over a few examples. An important issue for a digital genetic edition is to be able to link the author's revision campaigns encoded in TEI and the transcriber's layout analysis. So we want to incorporate TI editing more into the transcriber's workflow. For example, with P5 version 2, the TI allows to capture reading and writing orders. Transcriber's currently only allows to annotate the reading order. The writing order is determined by the editor, as this is a crucial part of their work. And we would like to bring manual and computational annotation into one workflow. So we want to capture in which chronological order the page has been filled in the same environment in which we do automatic layout detection and HDR. The following example visualizes what we mean by the writing order. And it comes from James Joyce's drafts for Ulysses. And although this example might be complicated, it's actually quite simple for, for Joyce. So this is how the page is filled based on the decision by the editor. So this is the writing order. Yeah. So the editor will draw zones based on their decision. So it will look something like this. So this is what we envisage for the workflow. Whereas currently what Transcribers has is just the reading order in a sort of chronological way. A few more examples of such needs typical for a genetic critical edition. Very briefly, one of them is detecting highlighted text, whether underlined, deleted, superscripted, or overwritten. And here we have an example, again, from Joyce. We have underlined in blue, crossed out, crossed out. These are important, very important events in the writing process, and they should be registered somehow in the workflow. Another problem is detecting interlinear editions. Here's an example from Samuel Beckett's draft for film. Note the neat handwriting. Another example which is related to the above is detecting substitutions. So by combining interlinear additions and deletions in the following line. Here we have an example from Virginia Woolf. Another issue for genetic edition is genre-based layout detection. Obviously we're not just dealing with prose works, we have drama, we have poetry. Here's an example from Beckett's Endgame with a typical drama layout, which is another feature we would like to incorporate. Something genetic editors deal a lot with are meta marks. So keyword spotting that we mentioned a lot, and we think it's a very useful feature, but we'd like to use it on meta marks. And here are some examples of meta marks by James Joyce. Again, another issue is version comparison. Very often you have words that are illegible in one version but are publicly legible in the version that follows or precedes it. Here's an example from Belgian writer Hugo Klaus. Last but not least, and this is probably the most crucial thing of them all, um, we would like to reach out to the community for feedback. Many of us are dealing with similar issues, so let's join forces and collaborate in order to solve them in the best possible way. Please do get in touch with us and let's work together. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Olga. Questions or comments?
we said the main task of this correct editor is transcribe the text and enrich with markup annotations. And my, that is if now it's really the first and the most important task to transcribe the text. It's just one of ways to make access to text easier. So if we have good written manuscript, it's not necessary. Uh, also, user can read text written by hand, and if we had, for example, automatic transcription, or also with, with, some, with some errors, but then revised by editor, and enriched with annotations, index, etc., it could also be good score edition, I think. Uh, thank, thank you for your question. Well, uh, two things here, I think. Um, what you said about legible text that may, don't even need transcription, I perfectly agree with you. If there is no need for a transcription, then we shouldn't transcribe. What I'm talking about is text by modernist writers that really do need to be transcribed uh, very badly uh, because of the handwriting, and not just because of the handwriting. I think the main task of the editor is not just to provide an accurate edition, which is essential, but also to comment on it. So the hermeneutic aspect, the interpretive aspect, that's why we call it genetic criticism. So the genetic part is actually doing exactly that, coming up with a perfect text, if that's at all possible. But the interpretation part is extremely important. Um, so and as far as your comment on the, the accuracy is concerned, um, I think the purpose of a genetic edition, or any edition, is exactly that, to be absolutely accurate. Because what are editions used for? They're used for scholarly work. So if we provide an edition that is not 100% accurate, then we basically don't deliver what we should deliver. So I think um, an edition should at least aspire to be 100% accurate. And then the question is, what's more sensible? Do we do HTR revised by a human um, editor? Or maybe in some cases, it's just more sensible for the human editor to do the transcription work because he or she is so familiar. I mean, let's mention Beckett, for instance, the, school, the writer I work on. At one point, you just learn to read his handwriting uh, because you've done it for so many years. And you provide a more accurate transcription from the start. So HDR is a very useful tool. And we are going to definitely incorporate it into our workflow. That's the whole idea. But sometimes you have to ask yourself that question. What's more sensible? to use HTR and revise or the other way around, just to manually transfer. But it's very individual, and that's the call you have to make based on the individual case. I hope I've answered your question. Uh, you're quite right, we're all individuals, and uh, my, my experience with, with the Bentham edition is that um, starting with an HTR transcript is a real benefit, and then the experienced eye can then correct the HDR. So we start off with rough transcripts, let's say from the PhD students, and then the experience editor steps in, and we have to go through further processes as well. So we, we you know, my, my sense is, is well, my, my practice, best practice from my point of view is to do it the other way around and start with the HDR. I think the idea was not to say, well, do it one way around or the other way around. The idea is to get both approaches optimized in one workflow, or in other, in other ways, optimize or add an additional layer to the existing web interface, um, web interface development that supports manual intervention for our specific needs, which is not a big archive need that doesn't need 99.9% accuracy, um, but for our specific needs, more. So. That, that's the idea. I, I think we all also believe in exactly what the Bentham team did, that having a base um, transcript being done by HDR is the best solution, but embedded neatly in our work. So basically what we want to do is to make sure that the editor can intervene much easier in the same interface. Thank you for the first question.